Well, hi, I'm Allison Arngram, and apparently I'm opening the show. It's called Game Changers with Vicki Abelson, and Vicki's actually the host of going to interview me now. But anyway, I'm Allison Arngram, and here's Vicki. That was uh, that was that was <laughs> wonderful. You even introduced me, which there is so there nice. Are, so yes. I love it. Before we do anything else, yes, and yes, I have, yes, to, I have yes, to show yes, 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 Chris yes, Junta okay. that that Allison did sign this for she you. She asked me for a picture for Chris, and she had a rather specific thing that she said he would like. And it says, "You're the rottenest little prick in the prairie." And there you go, Chris. You got your picture. Okay. Now I just have to remember to send it to you, yeah. Allison. Yes, you're yes, here. Yes, so I am. You, you've been in the living room a couple times. I have. I've been in this living room because we had the 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 women who write thing, and you had all the chairs. We did. Have and all now the this chairs. is we make all the chairs go away, and we just sit at this little table. I like it. It's very nice. <laughs> just it's a multi-purpose. Room. It's a multi- <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> we don't live in this living room. We just yeah, do shows. You live like the rest of us. You just that's come down to the living room to do and, shows. And my son does a sports podcast here too. No. Yes, that's, he okay, does. That's, that's, that's hysterical so, actually. Okay, oh, I like that. I'm going to start renting out the space just cool. for shows. Anyway, I should bring <laughs> so, my show down here. Yeah, you can bring closer you can. than, you know, yeah. Because I mean, it's like five minutes. So I tell have. us, yeah, because Allison lives in the hood. So yeah, tell me, tell us about your podcast. So I have a show, and mm-hmm. it's called, well, it's really, so it's called The Allison Arngram Show, because then it's easy to remember. It is. I would have to remember a title, and that would be hard. <laughs> so it's The Allison Arngram Show, yeah. and it's on um, UBN, so it goes out on their website, and okay. we go lo- live at 5 on Tuesdays, and then it goes on Facebook Live on, like, my page, my fan page, everybody else's page, and I have all sorts of fabulous people on it. It's fun. Well, we just so like talk. Uh, well, I had on Jerry Jewell from Deadwood. And she was here last week with she, us. She's on, we're working the circuit here. I, and love- I had on um, Donna Mills. And I've had oh, on Mary Ellen Ross and Michael Lerner from the Waltons mm-hmm. and several people from Little House in the Prairie and mm-hmm. Anson Williams and and then all sorts of interesting writers and artists and singers and interesting people. That's wonderful. Yes. Is is there a theme? Is there something that you circle around? Kind of. I okay. I why well, always say the Allison Argo show we talk about things that make you feel good mm-hmm. and the TV shows and the movies that made us feel good and the people who made these and people who are doing things to make the world a more interesting place. I love that. And I mean, I opened with people like Anson Williams or I said Michael Lerner, she's like, oh my God, the Waltons and Happy Days and Little House and the Prairie, these are the shows that we tune in now when we have a bad day to make ourselves feel good. And Absolutely. these are people, people who either you identify with a really good feeling of comfort and safety and home or the new people who are doing really exciting, cool, and interesting things. Like have you had somebody new that really sparked you? Oh, um, um, God, I have to look up his name. He wrote this incredible book about how his mother um, survived the Holocaust. Like, literally, she was in line for the gas chambers and was pulled out at the last moment, like, several times in a row. And it was just, But the book, the story of survival and this whole story of his relationship with his mother, and, and wow. we've rerun his show, actually. Wow. And we had um, Richard Pryor Jr. on, who's just I done just a book. I just became Facebook friends He's with him. He's fantastic. Yeah. What's it called? Book. Prior A Prior Life. A Prior Life. And so he's marvelous. Mm-hmm. And we've just, we have really fun, fun, and then well, Jerry and I, of course, were in hysterics all the time. Because we've known each other a while, so it turned into like girls giggling. So nice, girls giggling is good. So yes. all right, so show us your book. Tell us a little about because we're going to go back. So right yes. now we're, we're doing current events. So tell us about yes. your book. I I read a book. So I wrote a book, and um, well, everyone had asked me, you know, because it's the, this year's the forty fifth anniversary of Little House. Okay, of that the is the most ridiculous right? thing. I'm a hundred years old. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. We are all many thousands of years old who are on the show. Um, it's the we had the fortieth anniversary. Anniversary. Five years ago, we had this huge party. We were on all the TV shows, and we did a big thing. I, I remember that. Walnut Grove, Minnesota, uh-huh. which, which I call the scene of the crime. <laughs> and um, we all went to Walnut Grove and had a big thing with the fans. And we're yeah. doing it again. In July, we're all going to Walnut Grove. And like half the cast. Oh. Half the cast and 5,000 prairie crazed fans in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota. It's, all, it's the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum in Walnut Grove. And oh, that's my God. Really I love was. it. So we do that. So... Yeah. Because of this kind of stuff, I've been yeah. going to all these prairie events, and people kept asking prairie me, events. Uh, you know, the prairie circuit. They would ask me, well, what about this, and what's this, and yeah. how did you feel about that, and when, uh-huh. what was it like when you did this? And I thought, well, people have a lot of questions. Maybe I should answer them. And I started doing a one-woman show in 2002 okay. in New York, in June. And in the show, I had a Q&A section. And the show was very much what was called Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. And it was all about just spilling my guts. Yes, yes, I was on the show, and I am Nellie Olson, and I am a bitch, and sure. And just talking about And you're the furthest thing from. I know, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, but it was all true stories. It was all true stories and what it's like. It's true stories from the show or true from, stories from, from life? From life. From and life. About, 
Okay. What it's like to be an ex-child star and play someone that people hated so much and how weird that is to live the rest of your life like that. So I did this and then... Um, Which we're going to talk about a lot of that. Marvelous today. man, a literary agent, Kent Wolf, happened to come to the show and said, is there a book to go? I said, there, there could be. Is there a book to go with this? There could be. <laughs> and, um, well, ta-da, I wrote a book. Um, and it's fun. There's there's pictures. There's pictures. Yes, I have the book. I you have, have it. You copy. have it. Like, my own signed copy. There's, the there's me and Liberace <laughs> when I was like eight. So I my dad worked for... My dad was he worked for Seymour Hiller and Associates. My father managed Liberace. And so That's so crazy. Right, Liberace lived a few blocks from my parents in Palm Springs. Oh, and then we lived right around the corner from him in the Hollywood Hills, when he, the Hollywood Hollywood House. So, Did he yeah. have one of those? Because he had like a crazy house. <laughs> Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. Very, and they haven't changed it. If you go up there now, it's the same. They really? Like mess it up. Oh, that's so, yeah, nice. so I talk about my childhood and being on the show uh-huh. and after the show and what it's like to be a crazy ex child star. <laughs> and it's all it's all in here. And people like it. I made it to the New York Times bestseller list. That, which is so phenomenal. Congratulations. Yeah. And, and I was also, let me just <laughs> get to my list. I was on the yeah, Wall Street us. Journal um, bestseller list. I was 30 on New York Times. I was 15 on Wall Street Journal. Oh, and in France, I was number 15 on the I heard, I heard the, the French. French. I heard the French list. Love you to death. I started going to France first time in, in 2002, and I'd never been, and I, I didn't really speak French. I mean, I had like a little bit of high school French. I could ask where the bathroom was. It's like how do you say that? Où sont les toilettes? Okay. And That's so I a, could, they, toilet simple is such things. a nicer word. Find out where the bathrooms are. You know, okay. the key, and I could do that, but not much. And I started going, and when I got there, I did a talk show, and I found out that they are obsessed with La Petite Maison de la Parité. Love really, they were, and they, they love bitches, and they we like know, me. They we, like me. Well, because yes. bitch, bitches works very well in France. It's so true. I get there, and they're like <laughs> going berserk on this talk show. They're singing the theme song, and there's no words to the theme song for Little House. They're all going la 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 la. They're chanting a lot. It's like bizarre. So I'm okay, like, okay wow. it's, it's a cult. They're obsessed with Little House, and then of course they like Nelly. Or as I like to say, it's a cultural difference. They don't think Nelly Olson's mean. They, they think she's French. <laughs> so that's it. There you and go. So, I am now like David Hasselhoff has Germany. I am the Hoff of France. So <laughs> the I go Hoff of France. and I do a show there now, and I did a movie there, and so I I, I, I have this whole French thing going on. I, I love so that. I was on the French bestseller list too. Good for you. I mean, I wrote a book. I, I know what that takes. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, right. That, okay, that yeah. is just so phenomenal. I, I was an Amazon number one bestseller. That was as yeah. Far okay, as I okay. That's okay. huge. That's so, huge. so a, a, a guy named Gary Collins. Oh yes, hi Gary. Gary. He got on. Not the Gary Collins. I, I do not believe okay. it's the okay. Gary. I was no. thinking that the first time it's I saw Gary him, Collins. but I, I don't believe it's the Gary Collins. Yeah. But this Gary Collins got on this afternoon and asked me if I'd ask you a question. I oh, said, I saw this. I said, do me a favor and come back during the show. So let's talk to Gary. Gary wants to know. Hi, Vicky. Hi, Gary. Um, your question, what is it like, what was it like but he working calls, with Michael he calls Melissa Gilbert, Missy, you can't call her Missy Gilbert. Ooh, and were you and Melissa Gilbert, who played Laura, both very aware of his smoking drinking habits that eventually led to him suffering from pancreatic cancer when you lost him in 91? Oof. Um, were you guys aware? Yeah, he, I mean, everyone on the show, well, except us small children, and um, and it was it's very weird. We had a lot of Melissas. We had Melissa Francis, who was Missy Francis at the time, and it's okay. now Melissa Francis, and then we had Melissa Sue Anderson. She right. was the one that took the, the Missy. She got to be called Missy. Okay. But then Melissa Gilbert was called Half Pint. So even though Melissa, <laughs> they're both Melissas, and she'd been called Missy by her dad, which mm-hmm. was really little, she was the one that was Melissa or Half Pint, and Melissa Sue was the one that was Missy. So it's keeping your Missy's straight. Keeping, very, keeping your Melissa's straight. Very, very so, so, yeah. yeah. Every one on the show drank and smoked. It was like Mad Men. It was the 1970s, and these were the old guys who of come off of Bonanza. And the entire mm-hmm. crew, while we're filming, and half the actors, all have a cigarette and like a beer in their hand. Right. And this is just how Little House is getting made. They're all drinking and smoking. And this was considered completely normal. Right. And at the end of the day, they'd set up the, the, the boards on the, the, the sawhorses and open the actual bar and drink the hard liquor. And then we'd have the rap parties where we'd all go to the racetrack and drink. <laughs> and they'd drink on the bus. On the way to the racetrack. Okay, now are there people separating you kids from this activity, or it's all just happening? No, not really. No. It's just, just like, like, yeah. So um, are you taking a toke on a cigarette? Or? A lo- I know Melissa Sue did wind up smoking quite early. Melissa Gilbert took up smoking. I did not take up smoking. It okay. had the opposite effect on me. I was like, <coughs> really? I How did, about yeah. drinking? Drinking. Well, yes, I took up drinking. <laughs> not quite to the extent of our, our dear, dear Husho. Husho was on our crew, and he was the one who explained to me, he said, Okay, normally we get through about two cases of beer a day. It's a normal day is a two case day. Now yesterday was a two and a half case day. We've sometimes had three case days. Um, we're down to one case. So we've sent a guy out to the store because if we run out of beer, this show comes to a grind to halt. 
<laughs> Nothing's <laughs> getting done. We want to keep at least three, four cases in the truck. So at now they're drinking while they're working. Yes, from at like from five a.m. on. Yes. Wow. And nobody thinks this is weird. And nobody's like. I mean, surely they are drunk at some point, but nobody's fallen off a ladder or fallen asleep because at this point, I mean, after years, I guess they did this throughout the 50s and 60s, and but their tolerance is somewhere off the charts. I was married so, to one of those. Yes, yeah, right. The first so time. Yeah. They, they don't know. And mm. and Michael, Michael, absolutely, he drank his beer, and then he also, he, he liked, drank all day while he, he was working? He liked wild turkey often okay. in a styrofoam cup, oh. and the cigarettes, he all had the cigarettes, and he'd like put his cigarette out and go do the scene. And um, before was he, he was completely, was he healthy, completely healthy when he was doing Little House? Yes, yeah, Strapping. Strap had a gym so on the set in And he was so healthy. Well, that's what we thought he would never die. But you know, he was one of those people. It was like Jim Henson. Remember how Jim Henson got sick and mm. wouldn't go to the doctor? Mm. Jim Henson, the Muppets, and his yes. family, and he did, and he got. Michael was like that. I remember one time he got the flu, and his wife had to drag him, kicking and screaming, to the doctor. He, was, he did not want to go to the doctor. I'm fine. I'm working. I want to work. And the story is, yes, he indeed, he died of pancreatic cancer. And, there, you know, obviously there's multiple factors, but absolutely he drank and smoked, and those are factors. He he didn't want to go to the doctor for the longest time, even though it was already clearly, you know, pancreatic cancer has no symptoms at the beginning. Many My people do not know. My friend died last year from pancreatic. It's fast. So if you have symptoms and you're already feeling stuff and you're That's sick bad. and in pain, and you're going to, there's not really a lot they could do. They could do a lot more now. They could in '91, but you, you wait till. Still not so much. But he, he was quite quite sick before he even went to the doctor to be diagnosed. So. And were you Ouch. still in touch? Was he in your life? I had not. He'd gone on to do Highway to Heaven, mm-hmm. and I was running around doing dinner theater and stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't seeing him. Melissa got out to the house. I remember and saw him right before he died. Um, but I would sometimes I would be at like an audition at MGM, which is now Sony, mm-hmm. and he was still there. And, and I thought if we ran into each other in the parking lot, it was like hi. God, and like still happy to see each other. Hmm. He's a nice guy. Okay, everyone was a little crazy, and he was incredibly driven. I mean, he just worked and worked and worked and worked. He was writing the show, directing the show, producing the show. He was doing everything, and he acted like someone who maybe slept four hours a night. It was just like constantly go, 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 go. So he was very driven, and mm-hmm. this could drive some people absolutely nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was hilarious. He had a Warped sense of humor. Did he? He enjoyed practical jokes. He was always goofing around. It was like a 13-year-old boy had got the keys to the studio. Oh, cute. And he liked fast cars and blonde women and wild turkey and Marlboros, and that's who he was. Wow. And he liked to joke around and work really hard. So he was that guy from Bonanza, kind of. Kind of. And then he also had the thing, like, you know, we all got home for dinner. That was the thing. We didn't have 12-hour days. Wow. Well, since... Three well, qu- you, ha- okay. you have to, Three right? quarters of the cast are minors. Right. And when you got somebody around your team, it's four hours work, three hours school, one hour rest and recreation, plus lunch, and that was the rule of California. Uh-huh. Oh, by the way, those labor laws are only in California and New York. They're not the rest of the country. Also, the Coogan law, where you have to have money put aside that account. I know Jonathan Coogan. Yeah, it's, Jonathan- not, it's not national. It's only in a couple of states. Right. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, we're trying to get that national. Are you friends with Paul Peterson? Yes. Yes. Big advocate. Yes. For the act- and Johnny with- Whitaker and the yes. whole gang. Yes, uh-huh. yes. And we really, one of the dreams of anyone who's in this circle, Paul and these guys, Chris Alport, also, is trying to get the Cougar law to go national. Because right. it's crazy that you just shoot in another state and that kid doesn't get to have a bank account. It, 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 it makes no sense. So we were very lucky because we were in California and they followed the rules on our set. You'll meet a lot of ex-child stars where they didn't go to school. They didn't bother. They didn't have a three-hour school. Really? They just blew it off. They worked them like dogs. Mm-hmm. They didn't care. Our set... The welfare worker, the teacher, was standing there with a stopwatch and saying, this child has 15 and a half more minutes of school. You have to let him go back in the school room. Wow. So there was none of that. So it was very, very strict, and we had our work permits, and we had to have the C average or better, and you had to have a note from the doctor and a note from the teacher, and you couldn't. So we didn't screw around. So, so he, did you do you feel like you got a good education? Sort of. Because, <laughs> well, because, okay, so I go film for like two weeks, and then I go back to school for three days, and then I go film for three days and go back to school for two weeks. And this went on and on and on for seven years. You know, if you miss chapter nine in algebra, <laughs> it's not you a miss thing. the lecture, you're kind of dead in the water. You're but aren't to, they teaching you on the set while you're not? In, not well, it's glorified study hall. Okay. Now, we had good teachers who would help you out. And they, in fact, they did the exams for Melissa Sue and Melissa Gilbert, who were there like 24-7. Right. They would do their final exams. But I was back at regular school all the time. Oh. So it was kind of back and forth, back and forth. And I wasn't I was crazy about school, so yeah. I tried to avoid studying when I could. But I did okay. And you got through. I got through. I did. I got to high school, and 
I actually can like read and write and string a sentence together, which I know. People, you wrote a book. I, I wrote a whole book. Apparently, I can read. Um, but some some people can't. But Michael was a stickler for making sure that the kids did. We did follow the rules, and because all these kids had to be gone at the end of nine hours, right. there were only so many scenes you could shoot. After that, you had days where you said, well, let's do an all grown-up shoot day and we can go longer. There aren't too many grown-up shoot days, are there? Not, there's not that many. There's right. only so many you can do. And there's only even, if after the kids go home, well, there's like two scenes in here with mom, pa, and a couple people and no kids. So we'll shoot those. So you could only go so long. So he had also been through Bonanza and all these other shows and said, okay, We've all got families now. We've all gotten married and had 17 kids. In his case, practically yeah, 17 he kids. He did have a lot he of kids. He had like too. nine, he had like three wives and nine children. Like the tribe of Michael Landon, like all these children. And so he had all these kids. And by this time, the crew who uh-huh. come from Bonanza were all married with children. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay. That's nice. What he was loyal if, to the crew from Bonanza. Oh, yeah. I love that. He said, what if we all get home for dinner? What if we do the show? We start ridiculously early. We get there at like four or five in the morning. We start mm-hmm. ridiculously early in the morning. We work like fiends. I mean, they had a whole thing. Like they came in. There was some crew bonus incentive. It might have been a case of beer. I'm not sure, but it was if you brought the show in ahead of schedule and under budget. They were constantly coming in ahead of schedule and under wow. budget, just all the time ahead of schedule. So we were always on it. We would shoot. We get a whole hour show done in five, six, seven days, and we would bang these things up. And the thing was, everyone will go home for dinner. And he thought, well, yeah, little kids anyway, you gotta get up. And we did. People, five, six o'clock, we were out. There were no wow. people hanging around in the middle of the night shooting Little House wow. around five. And, and the adults mm. still talk about it. They go, I've been on countless shows and I've never had a series where six o'clock they said, okay, good night. And I like went home and had dinner. Wow. Well, that's, I, 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 there, I guess there are advantages and disadvantages to doing it that way. Right. I, I don't know what the disadvantages are. Right, if, say, if, we, if, it, if it had taken too long. Yeah. But I had people visit the set and they look at the, you know, they have the call sheet has all the things you're doing that day. Right. All the scenes. I had right. actors come to the set and they look at our call sheet and say, this says you're doing 12 pages. And I'd say, yeah, so what, what? They say, you can't shoot 12 pages. Remember, this is Panavision 35 millimeter old school stuff with the camera. Not right. Digital. They said, you can't possibly shoot this many pages in one day. And I go, well, we shot 14 yesterday. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and that's the thing. We did it. And so wow. Michael was a taskmaster. He was obsessed with work. He was a workaholic. Absolutely. He drank and smoked. He was totally bananas. But everybody went home for dinner, and the children all had to stay in school, and everyone was very protected in this weird, demented kind of way. Okay, so let's talk about, before you get to Little House, you grew up where? I grew up, I was born in Queens, New York, but we came out to L.A. when I was a wee thing, and I grew up in West Hollywood. I lived in the Chateau Marmont as a child. No, I you did not. Chat, I, the love the about <gasps> yes. I love the Chateau Marmont. I love the Chateau Marmont. Oh my God! So now, seven. were your parents showbiz? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, my parents. If my parents on stage. Well, we're, talk, we're talking as if nobody's read the book. We, we want to pictures. We're acting as if. Pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, see, pictures is good. There's my parents. Oh, you see that there? Can you see? Well, that's my parents on stage in Canada. My father founded the Totem Theater in Vancouver, BC. He was from a farm in Saskatchewan and left home at like 14 and wound up becoming an actor and producer and founded a theater. My mother was from a very posh, rich family in Vancouver, her father was a doctor, and she decided to be an actress, much to their horror, and she winds up hooking up with this weird guy from the farm who's running a theater, and um, it becomes a hugely successful theater in Vancouver, and wow. then they go to Toronto, and they get married, and they go to Toronto, and um, my father wound up on Broadway. He was in Luther with Albert Finney in like 62, and oh, he was in a show with William Shatner before oh. William Shatner was famous. That's he crazy. And Shatner were in a show on Broadway. It's really weird. There's always like weird Shatner connections. So, what um, kind of? Act, so your father was obviously a, a, a straight actor. Yes. Yes. Proper, proper, oh. proper actor. And mm. um, and then my mother wrote a play in New York. I mean, they were, they were theater people. And then my mother started doing TV. And then my mother started doing voiceover because they'd done radio. They had oh. also gone into radio, which was oh. big thing then. It was like the TV of its day. Mm-hmm. And my mother did cartoon voices. And my mother did an album called The First Family that was came out in the 60s, the one about the Kennedys where Vaughn Meter played JFK. Oh, And my. it's JFK and Jackie and the kids. And my mother was the voice of Caroline and John John. Aww. This thing was huge. They were like playing Aww. in supermarkets. So my mother, then after that, she could do anything. So she was cast for the Friendly Ghost. She was Gumby. Oh my, the Gumby? My mother was Gumby. She was Sweet Polly, Purebred, Underdog's Girlfriend, and Davy of Davy and Goliath. Oh, oh my 
I and always so watch Davy and Goliath on Sunday mornings. That's, yes. that's my mother. Mm -hmm. I still watch it. And of yeah. course, then she's also Davy's mother, Davy's sister, and all of Davy's friends. So there's a guy who's Davy's dad and like the preacher and the policeman and the fireman. But if there's a room where it's mom and the sister and Davy and four friends, they're all my mother going, da, 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 and she's like talking to herself. And yeah. So obviously, that's where you got all that going on. Yeah, it the hell up. And, wow. and then my brother mm -hmm. was also an actor. So he was on TV. And my mother was on TV in cartoons, but she'd also done commercials. And then my father shifted gears and became a manager and worked for Liberace and Debbie Reynolds and all sorts of people. Debbie Reynolds. He was with Seymour Heller's office, the oh. big on the 9,000 building on Sunset with Seymour Heller and the gang. And so he was doing that. And so when I was a wee little thing, I started auditioning. And okay, so uh, now how I, did, yeah. did you say, I want to do it? Did they say, do you want to do it? How did it start? Everyone, literally every single human being I knew, and some of our cats, actually, now that I think about it, we're in show business. Um, a cat would have kittens, we'd call one of those animal cartoons, you know, people do commercials with the cats and the dog, here, take them. I think Morris the cat might have been ours, I have no oh idea. Oh my God, um, that's but hysterical. We just so every living, breathing, sentient being I knew was an actor and was in show business. People would come over for dinner and I'd just seen them on TV. And I thought... Literally, when I was really little, I actually, I said in the book, I say it like it's a joke, but I swear to God, when I was really little, I thought everyone was on TV. They, like, took it in turns, and that everyone was on television at one point. Wow. And now that's sort of true. <laughs> <laughs> it it's kind, kind of, of actually way. happened kind finally of, it's, kind it's the 15 minutes thing it's actually taken place. but so I thought it didn't seem normal so I was like well where when do I go to work on TV and I started so how, how old are you when that happens uh, my SAG card says member since 1967 so okay. five you were five but do, you, do you know what the first thing you did was I know I was I had to have been about almost six when I did the commercial because I did the big um, National Hunt's ketchup commercial with kids trying to put it to me. It's in black and white. I am so old. My first commercial was in black and white. I love uh, the that Hunt's so ketchup, much. ketchup, but the tomato in the bottle. Okay, my daughter just taught me yes. that you hit it on the 57 and it, oh, huh, that's Heinz. Uh, but and then, just, then the ketchup comes out. I was trying to put tomato on because my tomato breaks and splatters all over me. And of course, they loved that. <laughs> so now, did you know our good friend Mason Reese back then when you were kids? No, oh. I didn't. I mean, I like, so, okay, he was on everything. I, guess I mean, he was. he was on the Howard Costell show. Mason Reese with the Idol of Devil Pen. I mean, yeah, everyone who did commercials idolized him. It's like, oh my God, he's in everything. And he was on the Mike Douglas show yes. like 27 times. Or I, mean, I would set a record. I met Mason in the 80s, but we've been friends for 30 years. And but... I play as his ex wife. Yes, I know. In a crazy web series where I've, I've been married to Mason Reese, which is a bizarre concept. Which is right a bizarre now. concept. And right I've, there. Left Hi, Mason. Him, I've left him for a woman. Played oh, yes. by John, is that the John Wallace character? No, no that's, that's the one played by uh, Aaron, Aaron Murphy, Tabitha from Bewitched. Oh, God. Or as the French said, Nelly et Tabitha dans gay mariage. They were very excited about this story. And then John Wells plays my mom. Okay, there you and go. And then Michael Learned is my mother-in-law. And it's, it's it, and yeah. Robbie Rist and Brandon Cruz and everyone else shows up and it's, it's just, it's, it's hysterical. <laughs> but yes, I was I played Mason, he's his ex wife. Or I mean, okay, so, and that's why on Facebook he'll start calling me wifey yeah. and saying, Oh my favorite ex wife, or my favorite ex husband and people don't know, they go, Oh, were you two married? I'm so glad you guys are still friends. <laughs> How long have you been divorced? And I'm like, Oh no, God, no, yeah. help me. Okay. So, okay, so so you're a child actor, you're yeah. doing commercials mm -hmm. um, successfully. I'm I not. and I was a panelist. There was oh. a show in the sixties called Juvenile Jury. And it was because they had kids say the darndest things, right? So right. everyone was ripping this off. So they oh, had juvenile I see. jury uh -huh. where all these little kids would be asked questions and give advice and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I was on it so much. I was the Kitty Carlisle of the third grade. I was like on this <laughs> thing all the time. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. So I was doing all this weird stuff. I did a movie when I was 10 uh, called What Movie? Throw Out the Anchor. Okay. It's not very good. Um, we, we called it Throw Out the Script while we were filming it. <laughs> Dina Merrill's in it. Dina Merrill is in it. The she post was, She was mm, nice. She was beautiful. Lovely woman, great actress. And then Richard Egan, the old actor Richard Egan. I know the and name. I don't remember what he looked like. This guy and his teenage son, his cute yeah. little blonde daughter. Are gonna Judy Tenuta. Hi, Judy. Hi, it Judy. Could happen. Um, I just, sorry, I just saw you the other day. Hello. We never, we never talk. We never see each other. I saw you five minutes ago. Um, so Richard Eaton is getting a houseboat for the kids, and they're going to vacation. He's this widower, and these people have sold his houseboat, and it's terrible. And there's all these weirdos living in houseboats in the woods in Florida, and so we have to get a new houseboat. It gets very complicated. It's a ripoff kind of of the movie Houseboat with Sophia oh, Loren, uh -huh. just like really badly done. Cary Grant, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. if you shot that in the dark with a broken camera. 
and like didn't care or edit it at that. Yeah, but I got paid, and yeah. so I did this thing. And how old are you in that? Like Ten. Okay. And it's oh. I'm cute as a button. Oh. Just just adorable. So I do this silly thing. And you're not a bitch in that, I guess. And, no, I'm not. No. That's thing. I'm really you're nice. Yeah. It's like really weird. I'm like so nice. And then like nothing's happening. So my father sits me down because he's a manager and he's being very professional. He says, "Okay, so you haven't worked this year. You're 11, and you haven't been booking." <laughs> I mean, you did the movie. We thought that would really be a breakout you thing. You have. Been You're not looking. looking, and we really thought the end of the movie. That was gonna be it. You're gonna, gonna parlay drop your, the your film, own. right? And, but it's not really going anywhere. And now some child actors don't work anymore. They get to a certain point, they stop work, or maybe they work again as adults. And so you need to face the fact that this might be it. I was 11. <laughs> I was washed up at 11. And then, like, the next week, I go out and I read for Little House in the Prairie. Okay, so, all right, now I heard... That was the comeback role. Yeah. I, <laughs> I heard you say that, that you didn't audition for Nelly originally. You no, were... that's what was so... Okay, it was so crazy, because they'd been shopping these books around forever. Like, it was oh, really? friendly. He had optioned the books of Little House in the Prairie. He okay. knew this was going to be a great idea. So he's going around going, I'm going to make a show with these books. And I go to this meeting, and he's like, we're making a show with these books. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to make you talk to them and, and not me, because I'm, yeah. I'm looking. Because you you're to... looking. And then I keep yeah, going, because... oh, look, no, there no, I am. Yeah, so Aren't we no, delightful? So, so, no, oh, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> he's trying, he wants to make a show of the books. And yeah. I have not read the books. I had no clue. Okay. So I go to this meeting, and they have yeah, these books. And, and look, every other 9, 11, who have read the books, except like me. So I'm sitting there going, I haven't read the books. And then ages later, I get called in, and I read for the part of Laura. Which is uh, not me. Right. And I knew it wasn't me. I was like, no. And really? then I come back and I read for the part of Mary and I'm like, because it was all country girl farm. <laughs> no. And I was just like, no, nah, no, nah, not happening. And then they go make the pilot because they've got Melissa. Oh, so you're not in the pilot. No. Oh. They've got Melissa Gibbon. They've got their Laura and their Mary, Melissa Anderson, Melissa Gibbon. They make the movie. And then they go to make the show because it sells, of course, and they buy the whole block of episodes and they have to the town of Walnut Grove where you got the doctor and the preacher and the Olsen's mercantile and the evil Nellie and Willie. So I go back to this thing. I'm like, how many people are in this show? And I'm sitting there with my father and I have the, the signs and I start, I said, this is not normal. This, this, this girl's a total bitch. And my father says, what? And I start reading it for him and he says, okay, don't touch it. Don't change a thing. You read it like that. Fact, put the pages down. Don't even look at them. Don't even look at the pages. You just go in and you read it like that. And so, okay. So I go in, and there's Michael Landon, and there's Dead Friendly again, and Kent McRae, the other producer. They're all on the couch, these three guys, mm -hmm. and they're like, go ahead. And I start. And it was the first episode where um, I'm in school, and they do the My Home speech. We, we're doing an essay, and my essay is about what everything cost at the house. <laughs> we have three sets of dishes, one for every day, one for sets. It's ridiculous. And I do this thing, and they start laughing hysterically. And then they said, would you do it again? And I said, yes, what would you like me to change? And they said, no, let's just read the thing about the house again. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh. And so I did it again because they wanted to see, like, was it a fluke? And I did it, and um, I was hired on the spot. I mean, that was wow. just, boom, that was it. It was over. Wow. And then never thought, my father stood there the first day we were shooting and said, no one's going to watch this. I don't know why they're spending this much money on sets. This thing won't go six months. Um, people did not think Little House would be a hit. Why is that? Because it was children... The Western, the Western thing. They had oh. just de-Westernized. In fact, it was actually a name for it. It was actually a campaign mm. by the networks called the De-Ruralization of Television. This is TV history. This is an actual thing. The de-Ruralization of TV. You had your, um, your Beverly Hillbillies. You had your Green Acres. You had Hee Haw, which is still running. Um, they couldn't kill it. And No, it's not. Yeah, Hee Haw. It's like on some weird cable. No, channel. it's not. Yes, oh, they... Yeah. Yeah, it's I've like streaming it. somewhere because they were running oh. it, and then they finally went to the Country Western Channel, and they just kept moving. They just moved it to different networks. Oh but he my God. technically is still running. It's the, the longest running show ever in the history of Earth. So they had all these, you know, and the Mayberry RFD and the right, sheriff, right. you know, and then somebody at the network said, "No, we need the city people. We need young married couples. We need young people. Teenage people are going to buy cars. We're going to buy clothes. We're going to buy products. Not elderly people on farms watching all this world out. We don't want the rural stuff. We want to go modern." Wow. What and year? What, what year did Little House start? We were in 1974, okay. and it was like 1971 too when they were killing all this off in the 60s and trying to go more. They went, "Oh, look at the success of like Man from Uncle and Batman," and this. They wanted to go that way, right? So they started killing off all the rural 
several shows. So westerns were out. And then they did the Waltons, which is another freak thing because they're in the middle of the Depression. It's all country. And they're like, no, 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 no. But they did the Waltons. And of course, it's a hit. And then Michael said, no, I'm doing Little House. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. Horses and westerns. This is all like going back to Mayberry RFD. No, no, no. And he was he fought tooth and nail, tooth and nail, wow. and of course it was the biggest hit ever in the universe, and it's still running forty five years later on every network in reruns on DVD. It's streaming on Amazon, wow. and it's on a hundred. Is it really streaming? It is. People are quitting their jobs and just sitting there with a the remote. Uh, uh, it's in one hundred and forty countries. Wow. It's like the most successful thing ever, wow. ever. <laughs> But Michael knew. Michael knew. He like got it. He got it right away. But a lot of people didn't. People were just kind of like, why? Why are they doing this show? Was it a hit right away? Not quite. There were people oh. who got it right away, and then very quickly it became it became a top ten show. Right. But the networks. I mean, the industry didn't quite get it. That was the whole joke. Was that everybody not in L.A. and New York watched Little House? The entire country, except for the city of Los Angeles <laughs> and the city of New York, all watched Little House. In part. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. believe that. But people in the industry would go, "You're on what?" <laughs> it was just like that does not exist okay so you book this huge success huge and yes. you're how old when you start uh, I'm 12 and um, I, I initially because I have no idea what a Nellie Olsen even is till I get this thing find out that I'm supposed to have this hair and they didn't tell me and I arrive on the set and they go why isn't her hair in curlers and I'm going in my way what and what and um, I find out that I'm supposed to have regrets, so they torture my hair, and then I'm sleeping in curlers every day and going to work at 4 a.m. and having the curls with the curling iron. And this is a nightmare because my hair just won't stay curled. So they're Mom doing it. Either. It's a yeah. nightmare. So finally, they say we're making a wig, and they bring in um, Ziggy Ziggy Geico, the he's the wig maker to the store. I think he's still alive. Wow. Ziggy. Okay. Ziggy the wig maker is <laughs> very big in Hollywood back in the 30s and 40s. And he and Larry, the hairdresser, who used to work for Betty Davis, wow. construct this thing, which is why it looks like um, Betty Davis and whatever happened to Baby Jane, because it was Betty Davis' hairdresser is sitting wow. there helping design the wig. Right. So um, it's stunning. Look at that. Look at that. And look, look, it's like, where, where's the line? Because they okay. pulled my no, hair. No, it's yeah. amazing. That's my hair, was my it, scalp. So very Was it smart. uncomfortable? Excruciating. That's what I would think. First of all, it's like it's big, it's tight, it's a wig, it's heavy, and there's a big metal comb right here Ooh. because what has to stay on through mud wrestling and down down. Uh, yeah, you. I love that I brought the picture. And going down a hill in a wheelchair, <laughs> it has to stay on. Chris, this was the picture I wanted for you, but you I can got, have this one too. I, I, if I got you want. talked out of it because, if you really because want. this is the more popular one, but I really like this you can one have for that you. one as well. Oh, okay, if you like. um, the close up, we screw down the hill, but yeah, it, it had to stay on. So it's like eight million pins and a giant thing and a comb, and it's just like ow, ow, like. For nine hours. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. It's not. No, it was horrible. Okay, so you're twelve. So th twelve, you're going through puberty. You're 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 having. Are, are you having a life? Do you have a boyfriend? Are you? Is it all work, no play? Well, I also, Do you have friends? I had friends because because I stayed in school. I stayed enrolled in the school I had started at. What school? Bancroft you Junior High, and then I went to Hollywood High. Okay. So very local, and I stayed in school. And most of the people I was in class with, I had been in class when. To the third grade. Okay. So, but it was you were the same working point. that whole time, right? But I would go to work and come back and go to work and come back. So my friends would go, "Oh, you're back!" And you know, where were you again? Are oh, you making that show? So I had a pool of people who didn't care. They knew me as me and had known me as me since I was eight, nine years old, and I was still Allison. I was. Did they get impressed when when then you were on the TV? Not in the slightest. <laughs> <laughs> they were Hollywood children. Many of them had relatives in the business. Right. Many of them had family members who were producers or directors or in, in show business. Mm -hmm. So they didn't care. And then Paramount was up the street. They used to go, they would go to the tapings of Happy Days. And because we weren't a three camera show, we were film, I remember them saying, Why can't you be on a good show like Joni Loves Chachi? <laughs> <laughs> we could come see you, wouldn't we? So, yeah, no, they couldn't figure out. Like, eh. So nobody was like excited. Mm. Um, sometimes when I met new people, they'd be excited, but then they'd also be frightened because <laughs> I was you were pretty scary. Bitch. I was so awful. So it did make it difficult. I thought, thank God I had the old friends because meeting new friends was very difficult because I my bet. friends would say, Oh, come here, man. They'd go, She's, no, I don't want to meet her. She's horrible. And I still, okay, 45 years later, my friends say that when they tell people they know me, they say, Why are you friends with her? Oh my and God. what's that like? Wow. My husband gets a lot of sympathy. They're like, you're married to Nellie Olson. 
can we buy you a drink? Are you okay? Okay, we're going to get to how you met him. That <laughs> so, okay, so you're on from the time you're 12 till you're... 19. 19. Seven years. And then I go back for one more because I leave the show in year seven. And then in year nine, they bring they had brought in Nancy, the evil adopted child, and decide I should come back and like face off with her. And normally they don't do that. Normally you leave a show, you've left a show. Thank right. you, goodbye, we're not calling you back. And then they went, yeah, come on back. And my agent was like, really? Well, you'll have to pay for that. And they went, yeah, okay, fine. Oh, well, all right then. Um, so, yeah, so for a great deal of money and <laughs> everyone was happy and I went back. And I wound up going back for this, like, two-parter episode in season nine to hang out with Nancy. It was crazy. So your life through those years, growing up in that, that what was... Was it stuck? What, what's the word when it's stilted? That's not yeah, the right word. Well, I had, it was like having split personality or some kind of time travel thing. Mm. Because part of the week, mm. I got to see me and went, when we were one shot on location, there were no cell phones. Right. And at that location, you still, I mean, service sucks. If you mm. go out there now, then mm. you've got to, mm. and the dressing rooms, well, because to, the air conditioning, you had to turn it off because the sound was too much. Right. The, um, there were TV and radios in the, the, they didn't work. There was no reception because in the middle of nowhere, and they still is hardly any reception. So we went to this place where there was no radio, no television, and no telephones for nine hours a day. The nearest phone was a mile down the road of the farmhouse. Wow. And I think the, the fire department guy had a walkie-talkie, so, you know, at least we had, we had that. But that was like it. So like what did you do between takes? So many afghans were knit. I can't, the amount of crocheting, the Rubik's cubes that were solved and unsolved, taken apart. Wow. Puzzles and mm. knitting. There was so much needlepoint went on. I wow. read. I read a lot. That's part of I became such an avid reader because it was quiet. You could do it if they're filming someone else's scene. You'd read. So we all found things to do, but there were there were no phones. There was no radio, no TV, and no air conditioning. And the bathrooms, well, they were porta potties or the toilets in a trailer, which is essentially an outhouse. Yes. So for nine hours, and you didn't really get out of the costume you were in the 1800s you were just kidnapped and taken that's to 1875 so, and dropped there that's so crazy and you hung with a bunch of guys drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and you were just kind of there for the duration wow. and you were separated from your quote real life in the 1970s and then i'd go back and i'm in an apartment building with a pool and driving a car and going to school and we, and people are talking about you know music and punk rock and disco and everything and we're having this Okay so are life. you behind are you with it with all that stuff cuz you're only getting it part time Well the other thing is also a giant nerd um Word. yeah yeah no I was very well, I was in gifted program mm -hmm. and like had a slide role and was in algebra with like um so I was sort of dorky and then in the 70s I decided I liked punk and so I was into the sex pistols and the clash and the jam nice. and I would go to the concert go get but it was like okay I painted my fingernails black now I have to get all the polish off before Monday morning <laughs> <laughs> and I can't dye my hair green because I have to have blonde hair of exactly this color, exactly this length to fit under the wig. I have to keep my bangs. I can't alter my hairstyle and I can't pierce my cheek or get a tattoo. <laughs> I put a ring in my nose. Which you're probably happy about now. But now, okay. but at the time, I was really pissed that I couldn't like have piercings and, and like dye my hair an interesting color and have permanently black fingernails and stuff. It was a drag. I had to like totally. So it was like I was living in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And how, so, I, I, so getting back to that question, I'm not, I can't think of what the word is when you're, when you're not retarded, mm -hmm. when your life is kind of, What's the word? I can't think of the word. You repressed? Know what? Not repressed, but it kind of retarded that it's that it's stopped. Well, because you're helping, yeah, things stop. And for a lot of child actors, it does. Parts of your life stop. That's why a lot of people trip with the education because the education just goes scree, thunk. Yeah. And mine didn't stop. It got mm -hmm. weird. It was like, oh, God, I wasn't at school for that lecture. That was probably important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so things were like, mm -hmm. but I was still going and mm -hmm. I still had the books and then I was also kind of smart. So I'd have like good grades up until then. So I had to go and and then I was someone who was reading voraciously outside of school, so mm -hmm. I took the proficiency exam and got the certificate that says, yes, you graduated high school, get out. Mm -hmm. um, but So I had that. But it was, yeah, there were things I didn't do that mm -hmm. people do. Um, but did on you, the other hand... Did you go to your graduation? Did you go to your nah, prom? Did you do... No. I didn't do those things And I either. wasn't into... But I wouldn't have gone anyway. Yeah, I didn't go. I was hanging yeah. out with people who went prom. <laughs> exactly. Right out of the prom. That's, that's so yeah, I wouldn't have gone... I wasn't going to go to the prom anyway. I hated those people. What, the people at homecoming court? Me too. The homecoming queen? Ick. I didn't yeah. speak to those people.
people. I did. I went to Junior Homecoming, though. That was very fun, and because it was at the Roosevelt, we went to a dance at the okay. Hollywood Roosevelt in the Blossom Room. So that wow. was, which is where they had the first Academy Awards. So wow. that was yes, historic. So I was oh, hey, to the Blossom. I'll go to that. But yeah, no, I didn't. I wouldn't yeah. have done that anyway. Yeah, I would yeah. have been home going, I hate all you people, like yeah. listening to emo music or something. So yeah. no, it wasn't my kind of thing. So that was okay, but it was weird. Melissa Gilbert and I said a long time ago that when people say, did they take your childhoods? And we said, technically, yes, but we stole them back every minute we could. Oh. And so Melissa and I, and especially when we were young. Were you guys close? Yes. So she's like the baby sister. It's, it's, it's so crazy. It's like we're mortal enemies and we're each other's house having slumber parties on the weekends. Oh. So we would try to run around. We were always sneaking off and playing pranks and hanging out together and doing stuff when we're supposed to be, you know, sitting still and being good and waiting for the next shot. We're like, yeah, right. So we were being kids, even when we were supposed to like How, not be kids. What's the age difference between the two of Just you? Just two years. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we would, we would be kids and mm -hmm. run, I mean, the, the time at her house where there was a party where we were throwing water balloons at cars. Okay, there was that. I, how there was not a lawsuit, I do not know. We were throwing water balloons at cars. So we kept doing things mm -hmm. and said, well, maybe you don't want us to be kids, but oh, look, we're going to. Um, and we did it anyway. And I did all sorts of insane and crazy things as a teenager and I managed to get it done because there was no TMZ and there was no internet. And so, so you could do it and get away with it. <laughs> So yay! Um, so I did. I you have somebody like trying to get you to behave? Occasionally, yes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I mean, it. But then again, the rule in Hollywood has always been don't get caught. Yeah. So <laughs> it was. It was very much then. It was like, well, you know, you're gonna go outside now. Just don't let anybody get any pictures of you doing it. It was like, but of course you were going to do it. Yeah. You were going to go out and you were yeah. going to have fun. So I mean, on the one hand, there were limits. Like I said, there were certain things like. Obviously, I couldn't go and go completely into, I mean, people did. Obviously, there were child stars who did become coke fiends and drank themselves into mm -hmm. a stupor. But I was like, I got work on Monday, guys. Eh, I got to go home now. Got to get some sleep. No, if I do that, I'll have terrible bags under my eyes. So I was like not doing a huge amount of stuff that like could have happened. Right. And then it was like, no, I got to get back home because, you know, I'd be off somewhere. No, I got to go home. I got to go to work. And then, no, I can't, you know, cut all my hair off and pierce my face. So... Because I was on a little house, it was mm. sort of like some kind of court order program to keep me off the streets. Mm -hmm. It probably reined me in and kept me from being the giant juvenile delinquent that I might have been. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so now you have this huge success from in a family of showbiz people. Yes. And you now go, Pshing. boing, yes, yeah. like everyone knows who I am. Okay, Boom. so now how does that impact the family dynamic of these people who are all in the business, who are successful? Um, how does it impact your relationship with your brother? Ooh, let's show say Ooh. the whole family mixed feelings because in a gang of actors, you have two things happening. You go no. as long as one of us gets a job, and oh my god, you got a series, yay! And then it's like, wait, you got a series? Well, I ain't got a series. Well, that bitch got a series. And then so is there jealousy and competition? Yes. yes. Like in my own parents, my mother and I once when I was older, my mother and I actually read for the same commercial, and oh, she, and she got it. I could have killed her, and it was. <laughs> But you, you read for the same commercial? It was a crazy, crazy character part. And okay. we both did wacky things. And then I was like, okay, well, here's what I did. And she's like, oh, that's very good. I go, what did you do? And then she did what she did. And I went, oh, you have to, we nailed it. Okay, fine, <laughs> I give up. So, yeah, but I mean, yeah, there was always insane competition. Wow. So there was the, oh, yeah, you got a job. And then, <laughs> fuck you. So, like, you know, absolutely, that was the thing. But wow. then you also had the thing that when they got the show, at first, we didn't have that much money. Mm -hmm. We were not all working a lot. My father just started his management business, had gone independent from Seymour. So we were a little broke, mm -hmm. as they say, or as, as my friend Robin Tyler says, broke is poor with hope. It's not poor, it's <laughs> temporary, it's broke. So we didn't have a lot of money. And so I get the show. And at first everything's fine, except then what happened is um, they forgot to put the money in my trust fund. So then they had to do double. And so then I had like no money. And this was a problem because what we'd set up was my mother said, okay, I've got the rent and your father's got the car payment. And here's what we're doing. Could you kick in for groceries? We're not going to make you pay rent. We're not going to like me. I was, all, I was paying for all my clothes and like my bicycle and all my stuff. Right. But they said, could you chip in for the food? I was like, sure, because I like to cook, and so I was involved in food mm -hmm. and cooking in kitchens. So I was sure, I'll buy the groceries. I'll pick out what we're having. I'll make dinner. Yeah. Um, so I was buying food mm -hmm. for the household. And then, of course, when they messed up my checks, it meant we ran out of food for like two weeks. Oh. <laughs> I was like, That's, oops. Yeah. So that was weird. Um, How old were you when that happened? Oh, like 13. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's, it's humbling. Yes. Mm. And so it was weird. So I was like, bring food home from the set. It was like odd. 
Um, and I talk about it in here. It's very hysterical. Uh, I was like, oh, we ran out of food. But that was the thing. Is on the one hand, it was like, yay, you got a job. You can buy food. So very much starving actor mentality. So wow. it was great that I had a gig because it meant I could kick in money. And then it was great I had a gig because everybody wanted the gig. And then, you know, maybe we'll all get gigs. But then it was like, oh, she really has the gig and your show's running for seven years now. Wait, what? And so absolutely, there was, there was, it was always hooray, congratulations, and can I punch you in the face? Yeah, uh, especially but, when you don't go out as a family and you'd be recognized, right? And it that was, had to be murder. Yeah. Oh, no, we all went out anyway. No, but I mean, you all went out, but then you'd go out and you would be the one that would be yes, recognized. So, that's correct. so yes. then there's that whole thing going on. And they're like, and you are? <laughs> now, my father always thought this was funny because he was around so many famous people with the thing management. We were at an event, and as we're coming out, it was like Toys for Tots or something. And he said some people came running up with an autograph book and looked at him, and then they said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're nobody, and walked away. And he thought this was hilarious. <laughs> and he said, I wanted to say, I'm a perfectly fine human being in my own right. I don't know what you're talking about. But he said, yeah, people who hang out with celebrities need to understand that, yeah, you're nobody when things like that happen and not flip out because that's what people do. That's what people do. Which is why my husband, Bob, says, and you're going to write this book. He says he's writing a book called um, Confessions of a Plus One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the, life in the fast lane from the passenger side, and it's a guide for people who are living with or involved or married to a celebrity, because oh, these like stressors it. of what to do when you're like on the red carpet and they're like, stand over there, thanks, and oh just like God. the weird way you get to get, you're the plus one, you're an, what is your name, and guest, and a lot of people. They can't do this. It's okay, not, so how did, can't you meet, do it. how did you meet your husband? Well, there you are. So in um, the 80s, uh, Steve Tracy. Okay, wait. Let's oh, stop. Yeah, so we how, 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 how do you go from the 70s to the 80s? What, what right, are you doing the 70s when, when, to 80s. With, with some difficulty, yes. Oh. Um, so in the 70s, so I'm doing the show, and then in 70, blah, 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 80, what the hell, 81, the, finally the thing wraps up. So I had a seven-year contract, and the usual thing, the end of the seven-year contract. Do you want to stay? Do you want to go? And I'm like, oh, can I have a raise? And they're like, eh, not really. Oh, mm. so I wound up leaving. Mm -hmm. and I said, running off to do dinner theater uh, and stand-up comedy. I'm, I'm going to make you talk to them. Yeah. I'm running off to do dinner theater and stand-up comedy. And I'm okay, so wait, wait. I want to talk about this. Yes. Because um, my husband is a stand-up comic. He taught stand-up comedy. Is that who comedy. I a picture for? No, he's the old boyfriend. Oh, okay. This was my ex-husband. So different. So, yeah, this there's two ex-husbands. So, um, and so he taught comics. He, he taught many who have gone on to have huge careers. How did you start in stand-up? How did that happen? I was 15 years old, mm -hmm. and my father was managing a comedy group called the Village Idiots. Village Idiots, they were incredible. Mm -hmm. They were the comedy group. There's a show called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. Oh, hell yes. Hi, right, oh. Don. I even did my Santa pack on Don Kirshner's Rock Concert at one point, and the Village Idiots were the, and has the sketch comedy group. That's it, with Mark Ganzel, mm -hmm. who later went on to work on Coach, uh, Jan Teresa Richard, Ganzel? Uh, Teresa Ganzel's brother. And oh. she was she was his baby sister. And oh, she was wow. closer to my age. She was the teenage, like, goofy sister. And then Jan Fisher, uh, who wrote the mo movie The Lost Boys, and Peter Jurisic, who wound up on Babylon 5 and, like, about a zillion movies. and everything. So they all went on to, like, do, like, huge things. Okay. And so this was the village, and they were in Don Kirshner's rock concert, and they were uh -huh. hilarious. And so I was going to see them in clubs. I was going to comedy clubs to go see the village idiots. And so you're how old? 15. Uh-huh. Because there were coffee houses were big then, yes. or comedy places or foods so you could get in. And I was watching a comic one night, and I was giving him a hard time. He was kind of doing audience participation, mm -hmm. and I was 15. He was kind of. Kind of. <laughs> he got more participation than maybe he planned on, because I was 15 and a brat. And so I started giving him a hard time. I was heckling this guy, poor yeah. guy. And he did the famous thing, if you, if you think this is so easy, why don't you try it? And I said, well, what a good idea. And I got together with the Village Idiots one afternoon at Shakey's Pizza, and we wrote mm -hmm. an act. And a few days later, I got up at one of the coffee house clubs, uh, John's Place, uh, down on San Monica Boulevard, and I did stand-up comedy. And it worked. It was a hit. And I then performed pretty much four nights a week, sometimes more than once a night, every week for the next 
I don't know, 10, 12 years. And are you continuing to write your stuff? Are people writing it for you? The Village or? Idiots were writing a whole lot to begin with. Oh. I began writing, I would say, well, what about this? And they go, well, fine, in it goes. See, there, good, you wrote a joke. And so I would write things and they would write things. They wrote most of the stuff on lines 15, 16, mm -hmm. but it was hysterical. Mm -hmm. And we worked on that. And so I was doing stand-up for years. And then I toured with the stand-up and then I was doing dinner theater, which is, you know, where you go and do in one bed and out the other in Edmonton, Alberta in the winter. And, um, but it was like sold out. I mean, it was the people liked me in dinner theater. It was a hit. I don't know. They loved this stuff. Fantastic. And so I did all this nonsense. So what kind of dinner theater were you doing? What, what uh, the you Earl doing? Holloman Fiesta Dinner Playhouse in San Antonio. And what show were you doing? I did Butterflies Are Free. Oh, yes. Sweet. I was the Goldie Hawn part oh, in the bikini nice. underwear. Oh, you nice. bet your ass I did it. I did oh. that, and then I did a French bedroom farce in Canada, and it was like this kind of stuff. Very mm -hmm. silly, a lot of underwear, because I was the cute girl in the twins. Oh, can she come? Underwear. Can she, she wear her underwear? Yes, I, I have my own underwear. I bring my own underwear, and I will do the thing. And so I was doing that in the stand up, and I did this for, for eons. And then in the 80s, I had remained friends with a lot of the cast, and well, still really kind of now all of the cast, but the Facebook and Twitter and our reunion right, things. Right. So we would run into each other. We were still friends, and of course, Melissa and I. Steve Tracy, who played Percival, mm -hmm. we remain very good friends. Uh -huh. So in the early 80s, he calls me up and tells me he's sick. And yeah, and I'm thinking, oh boy. And then first he says, no, I have cancer. And it's so early in the game, it's like 83, 84, that we're like, cancer, okay, cancer. And then he says, okay, it's not cancer, it's AIDS, and here's what's going on. And it was very distressing at the time because at that time, if you were diagnosed with AIDS, generally they would tell you you had about nine months to live. Yes, I there lost really it. were not any drugs at all. There were, mm -hmm. People say, oh, they had drugs that weren't very good. No, they had nothing. Right. There was like no drugs. Mm -hmm. And then they had drugs where it's like, well, we don't know what this does, but could you try it? Mm -hmm. And he was doing experimental drugs and the whole thing. And it was pretty bad. And I was only 23, and this person was my friend, and now he was dying of AIDS. And I went and I signed up and volunteered at AIDS Project Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I wound up doing the Southern California AIDS Hotline, which is awesome, mm -hmm. which is a very rigorous training mm -hmm. that you, because you have to answer the phone from people sometimes who are saying, hi, I'm going to kill myself. You had people who were very, very depressed. You had mothers calling who just lost their son. Mm. You'd have families who just lost a child mm. to AIDS. Mm -hmm. You'd have someone who'd literally just been diagnosed and just come home from the doctor's office and said, I have no one to talk to, what do I do? So they had to train people very, very thoroughly with mm -hmm. not only medical information, but to be able to keep these people right. calm and talk to them and get them to the right places. So I'm doing this, and the guy running it is a guy named Bob Schoonover, who is um, director of the hotline. Very nice guy. And, and what brought him there? Well. He, because he's nuts. Um, oh. He nuts. Oh. He was great. Oh. 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 In fact, he said at the job interview, they said, you're nuttier than a fruitcake. And they hired him. He had worked at a drug clinic mm -hmm. in, in a hotline in Ohio. And mm -hmm. then he had worked at a methadone clinic. Was in he LA. an ex-addict? No. No. He, he was all the rock stars. He was in this whole like group of musicians. And hello, all the musicians were dying of heroin overdoses. Yeah. And in fact, when he was at the methadone clinic, he worked with a lot of the musicians who came in. He was sort of like a sign to the, you know, all the musicians would come in and see him. And so that's... Was he a musician? Yes, he's in a band, in fact. Catahoula, that performs regularly at Viva Cantina in Burbank. You get Bob... I know that place. I like that well, place. Well, would you come? Because I will I think come. June, I'm like pulling up dates. Yeah, um, there tell us. When, 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 tell I'm, us I'm like when, sitting here going, right, oh my God, I have to like pull up my date because yeah. I didn't add the cards. Yeah, they I'm just coming. performed yeah. last week, and they're there again, June, June... Ah, June 29th, June 29th, at okay. Viva Cantina, Viva Rancho Cantina, How fun. Uh, at Catahoula, and they're marvelous, and he plays guitar. Fantastic. Does he sing? No. He, he's a guitarist. And he should, okay. but I, I tell him to. But there you go, but he plays guitar. Okay. And so he's a, a guitarist, and and all these other musicians start, they held a benefit for something, and then said, well, maybe we should do more of this. And so his whole thing in college, he got into psychology and social services, and he wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. So he comes to L.A., and... He winds up at the hotline because he knew how to run a hotline, and then AIDS was happening, and he's like, "Well, someone ought to do something about that." And to him, it was normal that here is this thing that is killing all these people and is really unpleasant. Like maybe we should do something. Like why would you not? And so he winds up directing the hotline, and it was the same thing for me. Is that I went and volunteered, and they said a lot of people when their friends were sick came in for a few weeks, and then just you know, went home. But I stayed for years, and I was in the speaker's room, and I did this, and I did all sorts of things. And people said, why are you doing this? And I said, why would you not be doing this? And why would you be living in West Hollywood and in show business, where just the community is being decimated, and not be doing something? 
Good for you. So I was, you know, that, and so we became friends. But the thing was, at the time, I was married and he had a girlfriend. So we were friends. So we go to all these events together. And the funny thing is, we went to so many things that a couple of the volunteers began referring to me as the ever lovely Mrs. Schoonover as a joke. Like, oh, here comes Bob, the ever lovely Mrs. Schoonover. So years, like seven years later, um, he breaks up with his girlfriend. I get divorced. And we realize that we're sort of dating again, and we're horrified by the prospect. <laughs> and so we're having lunch, and I said, you wouldn't want to go out with me, would you? And um, he said he would. And we're actually, he said, I think, in the New York Minute was Aww. what he said. So we decide to go on a date with each other. I love it. And um, that was um, March 31st, and we were married in November, and we've been married for 26 years now. I love that story. <laughs> it was like, story. as he said, we, I went out for coffee, and I didn't come home. I love that story. So, yeah, and yes. no kids. No. Oh, no, no kids. No. Okay. You have each other. Yeah. And it works. And the cat. Yeah. And the cat. So, okay, so, so you're doing stand up. Yes. You're doing this. Okay, now I heard you have another advocacy that you are. Yes, um, yes. Okay, so sexually abused people. Yes, in the two thousands, after mm-hmm. you're doing this thing and this thing, and this, um, I'm going to make you talk to them again. I I'm get gonna a keep, call. I'm going to keep making you talk to them. I just okay. talk to you, but you I know it's it's here. nice to talk to each other, but I want them to yeah. see your eyeballs because so, they're pretty. I get this call that they're uh, forming this group, uh, protect the National Association to protect mm-hmm. children. Would I like to be on the board? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, what they explained was um, the group they were starting. They said, well. People have been fighting child abuse different ways. They, you know, you have the police arresting people, you have the prosecutors, you have the psychologists, you have the people helping the children. What year is this? This is going. Two thousand three, four, and okay. And they said, but nobody's doing it really legislatively. What we're seeing are these loopholes in the law. For mm-hmm. instance, in um, over thirty states, yeah, slightly less now, but more up when we were doing it. Mm-hmm. There is a thing that still exists in a bunch of states. Um, a thing you call the um, incest exception. What? Wait, yeah, everybody's what? hair kind of stands on end when I say that. And what it is is in many oh, states. The, I literally just got goosebumps down my back. Someone is arrested and and convicted, convicted of, mm-hmm. of sexually abusing children. They've admitted to it. They are absolutely they've convicted. And say if like the neighbor's kid, they would get twenty years, thirty, whatever. But if it is their own child. Or a grandchild or stepkid, or they even said like a relative living in the home was the actual language in the law. So if it's like the stepdad or the mom's boyfriend or a grandfather, cousin, uncle, they can apply for this little dispensation. And in California, they were eligible for no jail time and expunging the record. So they weren't a registered sex offender. In fact, they had no record. So someone could be convicted. And it included all the bad stuff. It included like multiple counts and multiple victims and 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 continuous abuse. I think I just heard about this recently with the with the abortion thing coming. Uh, this they, has become back into the news now. Because the, yes. the incest mm-hmm. problem. Well, mm-hmm. it's huge. And so this thing was that they could have committed all these offenses and been, you know absolutely said yes I did it and found guilty. But instead of do it, they could be convicted of this and a couple years later have no record, open a daycare center, teach school because they they hadn't been. They, didn't count. Their first offense didn't count. Um, and something, 40,000 people went free under this in the many, many years. Now, that's just California. But there were two ways they did it. In some states, they used the old law. They uh-huh. would use an 1800s incest statute, mm-hmm. which is like an adultery statute crime against the marital state. So it would be like instead of pleading to rape, pleading to adultery. So instead of saying this person molested their child, we're going to charge them with rape, we'll charge them with incest, which only a two-year sentence or, well, probation allowed as opposed Isn't to Isn't that. that lovely that incest is only a two-year sentence? Or less. And it's usually, it's some places it's a misdemeanor, and it's, oh. it's some places it's a, it's a probation kind of thing. Because usually they're talking about somebody marrying their 30-year-old cousin. And what they were doing was taking this law and using it for people who were sexually abusing tiny children. And it was very, and then the weird one was in California and Illinois and other states, it was put in later, in the 70s. Yes, I talk about this now. In the 70s, they passed laws that increased the penalties for child sexual abuse. Woohoo, yay. And also, remember, mandated reporting. Remember when there was no mandated reporting? You could go to school and you could tell your teacher, you could tell your doctor that you're being abused. And they didn't tell anyone or call the police and they didn't have to. Now they have to. So you have mandated reporting. When that happened, a whole bunch of people got arrested who normally didn't get arrested. So they all got their lawyers and asked and got 
an incest exception in several states allowing someone who molested their own relative to have this pass. Okay, so now what got you involved in this? Well, I, like I said, I found out this was happening, and yes, I had been abused as a child, so I knew what the hell was they were it, talking was about. That, was it from somebody that you knew? Absolutely. Well, it's always somebody you know, but yes, it was absolutely. How, how old were you? I was six when it started, yes. And how long did it last? About three years. And did your parents know? Not at the time. No, as an adult, my adult, not a clue. And that's pretty much how it goes. And so when they told me this, I went, yeah, 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 no, I, I know this goes on. That part, I got that. What are we doing? And they said, well, there's this weird law. And I went, that's crazy. And they said, right. And they said, well, we've already changed it in several states. We've already gotten North Carolina, Illinois, and Arkansas. And we'd like to work on California next. And I went, wait, Arkansas? California's two years behind Arkansas and its incest laws, which you just, <laughs> just essentially told me. And they said, actually, yeah, kind of the, the governor of Arkansas was like, yes, please let me sign this. I really am tired of the incest thing. Please, please. They were like happy to like, we want to get off that train. Um, so, yes. it Was, was yours a, a product of show business? No. It, okay, so it was not because you were an actress. It was, it was I was home. So <laughs> it was uh, convenience, which is, that's the thing. When they kept trying to say that people who molested a relative were different for police. No, they were people who were lazy and didn't want to leave the house. It meant that the victim would, they, people molest victims they have access to. Mm -hmm. And that's what these people were doing, these children. So we changed the law in several states. Wow. And, and then there's a thing called Alicia's Law we're doing, which um, has to do with the whole um, child pornography thing mm -hmm. and the learning. And we're, we now have two groups. We have a group that's training people to work with the ICAT teams, which is Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. These are the cops who go online and look at the child pornography, the luring, the trafficking of children, and they see this stuff and arrest these people. So they need more manpower, and we're getting it to them, and we're seeing to it that their programs are funded and all that kind of boost, and helping them do their job. So we're doing all of this, and then there's various child porn legislation, because that's really crazy. Most states, child pornography, when you see people on TV and you hear that they've gotten a long sentence, it's almost always a federal, it's a federal charge, because most state laws are like nothing. It's very weird. Um, now at least we have a famous case that makes it easier. Jared of Subway. Yeah. Remember Jared of yeah, Subway? Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, when the big van... Wasn't he involved with the Michael Jackson? Was he involved with the Michael Jackson? No, no, no. He was the, the sandwich guy who had all the right. child... I know, yeah, but... Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. When the big black van pulled up in his driveway... Oh, he was a pornographer. Yes. Well, oh, he had okay. cameras in the house, too. And oh, plus, nice. The, yeah. So I'm when of somebody else. They came okay. with the big black van yeah. and said, and the warrants and the papers and said, we need your computers. And that's ICAC. That's Internet Crimes Against Children. Those are the people who come with the van with all the computer equipment and say, we have the warrants, we already know what's happening, we already know, but please hand over your laptops now. And they come and search and find the stuff and they can find it like that. And that's how that happened. So that's Jared, that was the example of it. Um, these people, I mean, when they find them, I mean, they typically they have hundreds of thousands of images, hundreds of thousands of photos and videos. It's not like one or two, it's gazillions. And most of it is homemade. There are people who download or purchase or right. borrow or trade, mm -hmm. but usually when they raid people, there's stuff that they, they make. There's children living in the house. Oh, it's their, it's their kids, or, or it's the kids of their babysitting, or whatever, someone they have access to, right? and that they are abusing and, and taping. And that's a thing. So Protect is trying to actually do something about that, and successfully. Like I said, we're changing legislation. We're training people to go work with ICAC. We're making sure ICAC is Name your association. It is the National Association to Protect Children, or protect.org. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it's now been going for years, and we're actually good at it, and we actually win, and we actually did get laws changed, and we did get legislation passed, and we have trained people who do now work with ICAC, and we have helped the police apprehend more people and pull children out. We call it the Child Rescue Technology wow. Program, because literally children are pulled out of these houses. And so I they, get to do that. Where do they go? Well, that's the problem, because sometimes the house they got pulled out of was their own. Yeah. Um, so if they're very lucky, they go to a relative who is not like that. Mm. And unfortunately, sometimes they do wind up in the foster care system. Mm. But other times, usually there is a relative or someone else who may have been trying to get them away from those people for years. So wow. yeah, that happens too. Mm -hmm. And are the kids well counseled? There, there are absolutely programs for that. And with the police, now, there's all sorts of, there's way more victim stuff than there was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how well anyone's going to do for the rest of their life when it's been that, when mm -hmm. it's been they've been used repeatedly in videos like that. But 
there now are programs, there are now are victim compensation funds, there now are cases where they can sue, there are now cases where uh, some of the victims who were heavily victimized, where their videos were heavily circulated, have written letters to the judge mm -hmm. demanding that someone who was then later arrested for distributing it get a harsher sentence going, hi, I'm a real person, that's really me in that, and this means something. So there's a whole lot more avenues for victims to get recourse. Mm -hmm. They're changing the statute of limitations in state after state after state. So when people come back as an adult, they're allowed to press charges. Mm -hmm. They're changing the statute of limitations civilly so people are suing people, like mm -hmm. the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and various organizations where children have been abused and it was covered up by the school or was the gymnastics team. Mm -hmm. So it's hitting the fan all over the place. So there's a lot more places to go. There's a lot more therapy and things you can do. Has is everybody been, really going to be okay? Has, yeah. has this been a healing for you, yeah. for your own situation? I have. I really, I mean, well, if I hadn't been abused, again, this is something I would want to do. Mm -hmm. When I saw what they were doing, I was like, yes, I want it. I want it in this. Whatever the hell happened to me, I want this. Um, but absolutely, mm -hmm. to... To do something like this and, and actually change laws and make a concrete difference and actually do something knowing that somebody else is going to possibly, just maybe, have an easier time of it mm -hmm. than I did and that other people did. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's huge. I know mm -hmm. a couple of close friends of mine were abused as children mm -hmm. and still suffer greatly yes. uh, uh, as a result of it. And it's uh, after years of program and all kinds of things right. to, to deal. It's difficult because it, it literally... Things change in your brain structure. It's your neural path. You know how you build up neural pathways? They talk about when you're learning the alphabet or tying your shoes. Right. You tie your shoes automatically because mm -hmm. you build up the neural pathways as a child going, da da. Okay. Well, what if during that same time period of learning, you're being beaten and tortured and sexually abused? Mm -hmm. You're learning and your brain is building up neural pathways in the same fashion that you would learn to play ball or tie your shoes. So that's why when you talk to people who have long-term abuse, they often have sort of like automatic responses of fear and of anxiety and depression that is wired into their brain at this point. So did you go through that? Yes, I had I, I think two, three shrinks in about 22 years of therapy, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's more they can do now and they understand trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, there's people who specialize in treating trauma now and they understand that the PTSD mm -hmm. that child sexual abuse people have is not just similar to, but is, as far as the brain goes, really identical to even the PTSD that people coming back from war have. Wow. The individual person may describe it differently and say, oh no, no, it's nothing like that. My PTSD isn't like there. But if you just look at the wiring, it, the, the, the brain didn't know any different. Wow. Okay, so let's. So we're going to lighten up now. Pete, do we have questions? Do we have questions? I bet we I have, would bet I we have, have a lot have, of questions. I bet we have a lot of questions. Yeah, basically, everything is terrible, but at Protect, <laughs> we're trying to make it less terrible, and it's working. First question is for that's me. Kinda the, that's the best oh, we can do. First I question is from Pete. Yes. For me. So, Peter, where's the peppers you pickled? What? Somebody oh, Peter Piper picked a yeah, pepper. Oh, was. God. Hi. We haven't said hi to Pete George yet. Pete, do you want to come over here and say hi first? Come be on the show. Come, come. And say hi. You can pull up a chair. There's lots of them in this Yeah, house. you can pull one up. There's, there's like 50 right of them over there. Yeah. This is the first time since the 80s I have facial hair. <laughs> I, it's real, I haven't gotten used to it yet. I haven't either. It's, it's a little weird, Pete. Yeah, it's, I know. It's okay, so we can't, we can't turn this way to look at you. So talk. So, so tell no, us no, what no. you're doing. What, so what did you do today, Pete? What I do today? Uh, I had an audition. You did, and what, what was it for, Pete? Uh, I can't say. Well, you oh, it's right. right. They mean you can't say what. Well, yeah, you can't, can't say, say the product can't. or anything. But the what, 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 what kind of character were you playing? Uh, I was playing a guy who had to read uh, on camera dialogue yeah. off a board and be very uncomfortable. <laughs> it was like a cheesy, you know, like um, nice. a narration video to promote I'm dental products. Out. So they basically. had you audition as a person who's like bad at auditioning. Oh, I, like I was that. so good. <laughs> I was so good, I had to do it three times. Oh, oh nice. Right. <laughs> nice. Okay, so, so Pete, while you're sitting there, why don't you ask Allison a couple of questions that people are asking? Because oh, yeah, go it's get your phone. Well, there's okay. things. They're coming up all over. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm they're all going to There's things okay, all good. over the screen. But yeah, Pete like takes yes. screenshots of them. and he Oh, keeps good. Them. Oh, by the way, I will be... Um, Hi, Steve Rollins, if you're still there. Yeah. I will be headlining the Grand yes. Hotel in Las you. Vegas. July 24th through the 28th. Nice. We love that. Pete is lovely. Is the rock and roll comedian. 
That's Pete. Oh, that's right there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Pete does. He's a headliner. What have I got coming up? Well, we have yes, Catahoula, my husband's band on the 29th at uh, Viva Rancho Cantina. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm at the Holly Weird Film Festival uh, uh, on June 9th. I will be there. Where's Holly Weird? It's, um, what's it, that place called CIA? Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know where that is? That's yeah. the place in the valley. And it's, it's very, I think it's their first year, but I did a horror thing, which at last call was um, Mephisto Box or Suffer a Witch. They keep changing the title, mm -hmm. but it's really creepy and I'm very stabby. Um, very stabby. I, I play a girl and her family were in like a satanic cult and she got away from them, but now they, people know she has magic powers. They think she just so they, they keep bothering her and trying to pull her back, and so I have to kill them all. They had it coming. You they are just, so they, the right person they so for that. Had it coming. You're the right person and, for and that. And they made day. a documentary about the making of it and about me called um, Hush Hush Nellie Olson, which they'll be showing uh, at, and, at the Hollywood I Film Festival. I love it. So that's so really you're the same. Betty Davis, Joan Crawford. Yes, yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah. And um, then what, uh, what am I doing? Oh, I have my Nasty Nelly tour of Hollywood is going to be on June 23rd. What is that? Great well, tell. On Sundays. Not every Sunday. I wish it was every Sunday. But um, on Sundays when I'm in town and available, Dearly Departed Tours, who are the most marvelous people down on Santa Monica Boulevard. Okay. They do a lot of the Manson tours, a lot of the murder, famous oh murder tours. Cre st creepy wow. things about the Black Dahlia. And they drive around Hollywood. Here's who died in this. But, but they also have a few happy tours. Oh. And the happy tours is the Nasty Deadly Tour of Hollywood. We're a little deathy. I mean, we go to Liberace's house. We're a little Lannan's deathy. House. We talk about a few famous <laughs> dead people. But it's it's not gruesome like the other ones. But what we do is we go to a three-hour tour on Sunday after... A three-hour three, tour. Three to six. And the uh, 23rd... We go to famous locations like the Chateau Marmont or Hollywood High or Paramount Studios, but oh look, I lived here. Oh look, I worked here. Oh look, and I have so I have personal behind the scenes stories of all of these places. Mm. And you get a free autograph picture and you get Q and A session and we stop for milkshakes. <laughs> Only tour in Hollywood. That's awesome. Where do you stop for milkshakes? At the farmer's market. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah. that's on our tour. So I'm doing that. Um, and then of course July, 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 July. Walnut Grove, Minnesota. <laughs> Walnutgrove.org, Walnut Grove, Minnesota, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum in Longwood has July 11, 12, 13, 14. Everybody, Mrs. Garvey, Miss Beetle, Almanzo, Baby Carrie, Baby Grace, the John Jr., me, half the freaking town, half the prairie is coming. Wow. And we're all descending upon Walnut Grove in that second week in July, along with about five, 6,000 raving prairie fans. And um, they do their prairie pageant, and we'll have all sorts of uh, Q&As and autograph signing and hijinks for several days in the actual real Walnut Grove because it is the 45th anniversary. When is this? Little house in the this is July, 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 July. 11, 12, 13, that's happening. Um, then I'm at the Roy Rogers Festival in Ohio. Where? Um, Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Oh, it's a, this one's just outside of Columbus. Where are you in from in Ohio? Cleveland. Well, and my Pretty husband's close. from Akron, so you should come on over. Um, oh yeah, Akron, absolutely. And then I'm in Mansfield, Missouri in September. Uh, oh, I'm doing the Galardi Fest as well in, in October. Cleveland. Yes, I'm doing that one. Yeah. I'm doing the Galardi Fest. Look at all so you're, yeah. getting, you're getting too too local. You're going to like come <laughs> to my stuff. This I'm going great. to Mansfield, Ohio in August. Oh, wonderful! For, uh, the Shawshank uh, uh. 25th anniversary. He was in Shawshank. He was yeah. in Shawshank. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Naked okay, so let's, let's, so let's, we're let's, just like let's, chattering let's, about so let's, let's, let's go let's ask, yes. let's ask some questions. All right, here we go. Yes, questions. Uh, okay. Alice, okay. Things. who was yeah. Baby Grace? Baby Grace was played by twins, the Turnbull twins, Wendy and Brenda, who've grown up to be lovely young women. And Wendy, Wendy Lulee, has written a book. Oh. And it actually comes out. Oh, you tell out. me about this. I'm very excited. It comes out in August, and they're going to have pre copies available at Walnut Grove in July. We're hoping they have enough. And I just got my copy, and a few of us got secret copies to read to like talk about. But no, it's 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 actually it's a trip. It's a little house. It's a devotional. It's the Prairie devotional. It's a whole spiritual, emotional exploration thing. And each week, there's a quote from Little House in the Prairie and a quote from the Bible and then a whole thing of where she ties the whole thing together. Okay, the third chapter is called Dealing with the Nellie Olsons in Your Life. <laughs> so it's also hysterical in places. So it's, and people are reading it and going, this is great, this is great. I'm reading this thing, this is fantastic. I'm getting all this stuff out of this book. So yes, Baby Grace, of all people, Wendy Lulee has written The Prairie Devotional and it's fantastic and it comes out in August. Okay, Perfect. great. Okay, uh, let's Grace. see. Was there ever a plot that Nellie was supposed to have but was scrapped? Darn. 
time. No. In, oh, in like the first year of the show, when we were being very goody-goody, mm. they sometimes would send in scripts and people would say, oh, no, that's all we're going to do that. And then like five years later, they would completely do that in an episode. <laughs> um, there was something about, you know, finding well, a baby. the wheelchair. Hi, Come right? On, yeah. Oh, and later like the blind school burning down and then Sylvia, part one and two. Do we even go there? Where the girl, that her clown rape. Um, the little girl is raped by a wow. man in a mask, and that's an episode of Little House on the Prairie, and, it's, and she dies. And it's, um, but wow. we, by the but yeah, by the seventh season, we're like, sure, we're doing, it. and then Albert's on morphine for God's sakes. So we're doing things like that, but we didn't do that in the first year. There was an episode where a woman is found dead, and her baby is like that. Later, like was an episode, but they were like, oh no, no, that's too heavy. We can't do that. There was an episode where Nellie. Through her just general being an idiot, mm -hmm. someone gets shot, and she's really kind of responsible. And they were like, "No, no, no, that's terrible." Totally did that with Nancy a few years later. Completely, like, it was just like, "Sure." Um, so yeah, we later had people on morphine and people dying of horrible diseases, and blind schools burning down with children in them, and terrible, terrible things happen all the time. And nobody thought anything. But in the first year, we did have a couple episodes that they said, "Oh no, we can't do that." Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, Mike and Nathan uh, says, this is compelling, yet I can't explain why. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mike. That's very clever. <laughs> because all roads lead to Little House in the Prairie. There you go. No, right. as, as my husband said, never underestimate the power of the prairie. Yeah. No, it's really because of this why Little House in the Prairie, they're still watching it 45 years later because it's compelling okay. and nobody knows why. But it, but it is. <laughs> they still are watch it. It's right. calming. When it's on, I have to watch because I See? feel so relaxed. And then you come on and i got to turn and, it on. And then you have an anxiety attack because um, I'm there. Yes. Let's see. Allison, will you ever release a comedy album? Ah, mm. you know I should. Technically, I did. Now, see, here we go to another crazy story. So when I was like 15, 16 years old, yeah. uh, I remember Jimmy Carter was in the White House. And remember, my mother had done the first family album going, ha, 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 let's do an album of the president playing the little girl. So here we had a president, we had a kid in the White House, we had Amy Carter, who was cute and blonde and kind of funny, kind of goofy. So, yes, I did a comedy album called Here's Amy, and it was a whole sketch thing of the Carter family. Yes. Oh, how funny. It was very silly. But, again, there was no internet. So, yeah. I mean, we had a comedy album, you were supposed to go on, what, like Mike Douglas and promote it or something? Mm -hmm. like, and it just, it, uh, now, I think it, it would have been like a hit now. But, right. Uh, of course, it has been re-released. It is on CD and iTunes, so there if you really you want a copy of Here's Amy. But the Village Idiots are on it. Peter Jurisic's on it. Mark Ganzel, so all these famous people from the Village Idiots are on it, so it's kind of weird and cool in mm -hmm. a way. There's like sketches about Nixon, it's like that kind wow. of thing. Yeah. Uh, did very seventies. Did you ever meet Barry Crimmins? That sounds very familiar. Did I meet Barry? Is this like Barry Crimmins asking what? what who was who this? Uh, Nikki Luongo. Who is? Who's Barry Crimmins? Don't know. Okay, That's we don't all know. She says. Okay, well, um, Allison. Did I might you... have. I've met like thousands of people. I'm always going. Do I know you? Do I know me? Yes, you may have answers this to some degree. Mona Cooper asks, Allison, did you encounter casting directors that couldn't see you in any other role? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It really is. I mean, typecasting is crazy. And with Little House, they were so obsessed with us being in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still people who think we're like about 150 years old. Like, isn't that real? It's real, right? That's like historical documents. Um, my agent submitted me for something, and I was like 22. It was like after the show. And they said, no. And he's like, oh, come on. Because there's always these no, 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 no. And they said, well, this show takes place in present day. And my agent was like, she's not Pioneer Barbie. She doesn't come with a dress. What the hell are you talking about? So absolutely, there was this, you are, and, and of course, when I did it, I finally did an NBC TV movie. A few years later, and what did I do? I did I Married Wyatt Earp with Marie Osmond. And I was oh in God. the dress and the thing with the stagecoach all over again. Awesome. So yes, it was so, a thing. So did you lose work because you'd go in and they were like, they just couldn't see past? Could not. And then also thinking that I was like really like that, terrified of me still. Still, I mean, now when people call me now and say, well, we have a bitch role, do you mind? I'm like, <coughs> yes, of course, I want the bitch role. I like, I like playing the bitch roles. Yes, I mean, and you play it up. And I've had the, the opportunity to play nice, nice, nice people. I've done several plays and some of these web series where I've gotten to be really genuinely nice people. Mm. But when they let me be horrible, I'm very happy about it. So I don't mind that part. So mm -hmm. I just, you know, call me. <laughs> it's just really I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's and you're really easy to find. I'm looking I have an agent. Go on IMDb. Look me up. Really Somebody would like to know if they can uh, buy a book from you but sign. Absolutely. Um, if you go to uh, my fan page up there, 
uh, the Allison Argram fan page on Facebook. Hmm? I see I'm like pulling it up right now so I can like follow along here. So, so you can tell us. So I can tell you if you go to the okay. Allison Argram fan page. A L I N. There I am. And it's the one you can tell it's me because it has the big pink thing and it has uh, the my audible the the audiobook on there too. And you go there if you look, there is actually a little button. There is a, a shopping button on there. Yeah. And that takes you to the store, to my square store, where you can indeed, you can purchase books and t-shirts and scented candles. We have Nellie's Warm Cookie and Allison's Hot Orange Tart. They're fantastic. <laughs> and you can buy all kinds of scrap. And and so we'd love to have you. But yes, absolutely. Hit me up uh, on the internet. Okay, wait. We'll send all right. I just saw a couple. Um, what's your brother Willie up to? Yes. Jonathan Gilbert. Well, technically we don't know. He's our own personal Where's Waldo. Uh, Jonathan Gilbert didn't, didn't really want to be in show business. As he, he was the original along for the ride guy. He, Melissa Gilbert's younger brother. Uh, he, he came to the audition and Melissa Gilbert got the part of Laura and they went, who are you? <laughs> I'm you look, you're Willie. Good. Come here. And he was, boom, he was cast. He was going, uh, and he was great because he was always sort of lost and open mouthed <laughs> and like, he wouldn't read the scripts. It started because he was little and couldn't read, and then he could read, and he still said, I'm not going to read the scripts. And I said, why? And he said, because I like to be surprised when I see it on television. <laughs> like, okay, you're a very strange wow. child. Okay. Um, but he, it's why Willie's always like, what? Where? If somebody comes to the door, and he's like, who are you? Um, he's never, he's always surprised and in the moment, and it kind of works. Cute. But yeah, when he when he grew up, he left home and said, no, I'm, I'm not doing this, and, and goodbye. I packed my things, and I'm going and mm. later. And um, he took off, and he's kind of gone all over the world. He pops up about every two years or so and phones in. And, That's interesting. But really, I, right now, I couldn't, I could not tell you where he is. Are you He's still okay, in touch with worries. the chick who played Nancy? Duh! Yes, that's <laughs> Alison Balsett. She's marvelous. She sings. She has CDs out, and and she comes to okay. some of our events. We like her. She she also again. She are was, you in touch with the guy who played your brother on the show? Yes, that's true. Oh, that's really. Oh, yes, that's Melissa oh, 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 yeah. oh, her brother they, played, played your my brother. brother. Okay, I'm so confused. I'm and well, confused. Allison, the other Allison, played Nancy, and boy, people hate her. People really hate her because she she was she was. She was creepy. She was just psychotic and awful and terrible and fabulous. And she's, a, and once again, a very, very nice person. And totally, you can buy her CDs and see her sing in concert. She's lovely. Why did you take Laura Ingalls' horse today game? <laughs> wait, wait, what? Oh, that was showing today. Oh. It's the Christmas at Plum Creek. That's right. People. See, I know too much about this. Some people were posting on one of the fan pages that, indeed, the yeah. Christmas episode, Christmas at Plum Creek, where... Laura wants to get her mother a stove, but, you know, they're poor. So, um, meanwhile, everyone's doing kind of that, you know, Gift of the Magi thing, trading their stuff. They, uh, he wants to get Laura a saddle. And, and, but Laura goes there, and she wants the stove for Ma and talks to Mr. Well, Nellie wants her pony. So she says, yes, I'll hand over the pony if I can have the stove and makes a deal with Mr. Olsen to sell him her horse. So the stove arrives and they're freaking out because Pa was like making a bunch of wagon wheels and going to pay on credit and maybe get it later and give her like a little card with a picture of a stove. And suddenly the stove is there and he can't figure out why. And then um, I'm there to be repo man and take her horse. Repo on man on the horse. In the middle of Christmas. I'm here for your Crystal horse. Crystal's husband is saying hi. I'm going to see you Crystal tomorrow, Hood. Crystal, at the gig. Um, she's saying hi to you. You met her here in the house uh, last month. Um, all right, who else? What do we got? You got one? One more. <clears throat> Let's see. Here this we is go. Fun. Is it true, uh, Allison, that Michael Landon was very on the spot for everyone knowing where lines on the show. Oh, yes, yes. As I said, absolutely. That was the crazy thing. I mean, he liked to goof around. He was drinking and smoking and carrying on. But the Taskmaster work focus thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do and knew their lines. And like Melissa Gilbert and I were like little creepy one take wonders, forty year old midgets. We did stuff. I mean, if if we weren't on location where there's like noise and birds and planes going by, we right. generally got stuff done in one, two takes. And you were absolutely expected to know what you were doing and know your lines. Mm -hmm. And if some for some reason you somehow did not know your lines, you would just you would get the look like, is there a problem? Did you have a trick? Did you have a secret to do it? I don't know. A lot of child actors become mm -hmm. child actors because they have abnormally good memories. Mm -hmm. They can memorize huge lists of things. And Melissa Gilbert is one of those people, and I am one of those people. And we knew all our lines and everyone else's lines, and then we would play memory games. Like, while we were filming, 
we would be doing that weird like I'm going on a trip and I'm taking you name things in alphabet right order. right so we'd be we'd be coming up with like 26 items and then go back into the scene and no I mean it was like freakish so um we were weird freaky children who memorized everything I love that and that just made it sort of convenient so yeah no I've always been able to do that which is like just weird I'm gonna go back over there go on that side and I apologize if I smell like in and out uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite all right. So, we, yeah, thank you. So, um, Mona Cooper said it was the best show of her childhood. Because um, it was. Because it, it was the best show of everyone's childhood. And Here, I'm pulling up a thing. Now, there, if you go on Facebook, there's a Little House cast reunion page. Yeah. And that's where you can get all the information about our fabulous reunion. Somebody said, I still think Nellie should have pierced her nose. That would have been an awesome episode. <laughs> Mrs. Olsen throwing a thumb. What have you done, Bennett? Coming with the big nose ring. That would totally um, work. Um, just looking to see if I see any other questions. Pete, do we... Do we because I don't want to miss anybody. Then I feel so guilty when I go later and... Uh, yeah, I say most of the... Unless anything came up while I was sitting there. Is Nell still alive? No, unfortunately. Mm. Yes, Richard Bull died just a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, who was, Nell, who was wonderful. And Catherine McGregor. Uh, just died uh, like about a year ago. Who was the actor? Is that wait? That was Mrs. Olson. Okay, yes, yes. yeah, who played your mother? Died 90s, recently. In her yeah, yeah. 90s, yes, wow, yes, yes. Wow, wow, wow. Um, get some Stevie. Th what? Throw me some Stevie from Throw Out the Anchor. Oh, oh, somebody like saw it. Did someone see Throw Out the Anchor? Jeff Barry did. Uh, somebody actually saw Throw Out the Anchor. Yes, um, Stevie, Stevie Porterfield was my name. And um, yes, I, I was a child who liked squirrels and little animals and think, will there be squirrels and possums and critters and stuff? Jeff and Barry. Can we catch some? <laughs> that I did, you know, that goes. So did you get a second egg cream? There's a really weird story in the movie about an egg cream. It doesn't make any sense, but that's like the whole plot point. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff Barry, that was for you. That was that was really weird. Yeah, I, was I think I think we got everybody's questions. Allison, it's been such a joy. This is good. Yes, a Little House in the Prairie cast reunion, Walnut Grove, because we okay. did this once in 2014. Now we're doing it again, and um, they have the whole thing. It's it's just absolutely. Look, there's the whole gang. Here's who's all coming. Okay, tell us. It's just crazy. Who's gonna mm -hmm. stop that? Yeah. Um, it's like going to this other page. But yes, so you can, oh, Stan, the Carters. Now, if you watch a show in the last seasons, um, the Carter family, John and Sarah Carter, moved into the little house. They're all coming, and the two little boys. They're all coming. They're all John's coming. Like, yes, yes, they're all coming. So you get you get like everybody from the show. We're all coming, so it's going to be fun. So if you guys want to see more Allison, she's got her podcast. She's yes, got a I live mean, show. Allison Arngram Show, uh, UBN uh, Go, and it, that's on their website, and then it's on my website, and every Tuesday, Live at 5, so you can see me there. Live and at 5, I love it. Live at 5 on Tuesdays, and then you can um, go and take the Dearly Departed tour and ride around a van with me for three hours and hear weird stories. And um, and see and, your stand-up? And, and um, yes, and you come see me stand-up. Well, I just did it in New York. I got to do, And then if you're in France... I'm usually performing in some small village somewhere, so you can check that. Some but small village, really? You, yeah, I do. Oh, it's awesome. You go to these funky little places. And you like go, what? Oh, I performed in um, a mental hospital, a <laughs> castle, um, a, a little chateau thing. Something, the, a mental and, hospital like, works for multi -purpose me. Multi-purpose rooms in little parks, like little towns. We do not have a theater. We have the multi-purpose room, but we make a theater. It's very good. You do the show. Um, so I go over and do that. Go to my website, which is bonnetheads dot com <laughs> bonnetheads dot com and be sure to sign up for the Nelly newsletter and uh, hit me up on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram I'm Allison Arngram and um, yes get your newsletter and and come see me thank you so much for thank you us. it was it was so joyful. oh and protect dot org that's the point you want to go to protect dot org and read all what we're doing yeah and, and I love yeah. that too and before we go I just want to give a shout out to Rick Smulky who is uh, my savior my 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 wonderful soulful who who makes all of my stuff and so if you need any stuff what do you think let's see night he, he, oh, yeah he Kleenex does. boxes yes I could have Nelly Olsen Kleenex you boxes. could and you could have bookmarks for your books that oh, you, I have, you have. have you seen have you seen my bookmarks yes I do I have a bookmark yeah, have Please. Have a Rick's are great and so if you need more Rick is fabulous oh. and he will do them for you because yeah, yeah see there you go the Facebook look at look at all those people coming look look everyone's I coming this is coming everyone's all right wait we're on commercials now no not really so much and my hairdresser Nicole Venables of the Ruby Begonia Salon who has a hair spray called hair crush love called fuck off called oh, fuck off she's fabulous nicole wow at the ruby begonia salon and you can get her 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 products and you can also have her quaff your hair and and next week eileen graf who uh, yes i love her yes, yes. and i i, 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 I saw her and i love my wife 
Oh my God. A million years ago. And so she's a Broadway actress. We're going to have great fun with her. We and know then, all the same people, don't yeah, we? Yeah, well, because Harlan is so yeah, wonderful. Yeah. And oh. Anson might, brought me to Harlan, right. who got me to you. And Harlan Boyle, hi, how are you, Harlan? And also, um, Elliot Gould said yes to me. So Elliot Gould will be on the show on, oh, on June 12th, which is... I love him. Me too. See if he wants to do my show. I will. <laughs> he's, I will. He's so fabulous. We've been talking on the phone. He's such a sweetheart. And on the 19th, Fred Willard will be with us. Oh, so, I know. Hilarious. So I'm so excited. Um, Very fun things. Oh, and yeah. Tony, Dan O'Shannon. Dan O'Shannon. Uh, Dan O'Shannon. But, you know, I'm, I'm like... Where where I said it, how 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 high is the percentage that you're going to be able to do it, Dan O'Shannon? And he said to the moon. We're 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 aiming high to the moon, and I said Alice. But anyway, um, so Dan O'Shannon, who Modern Family, Cheers, Frasier, showrunner, executive producer. I I don't know if he was the showrunner, but writer. Producer, executive producer on Modern Family has won a gazillion Emmy awards. And credited for the final episode of New Heart, where Suzanne Plasek, <gasps> which is crazy. Yeah. So Tony Tenniel said she'll do my show. I, oh, oh well, she's phones in, She's phoning in. She's like, I'm not coming down there. All right. I said, fine, fine, call me, call me, whatever. All right. Like Tony Tenniel said she'll When is that going to be? That's you know? in June. June. Okay, look up the date. So and <laughs> Dan will be with us on July 10th. So lots of June 25th, on, June 25th, June 25th, June 25th. and also yes. the next women who write. Oh um, yes, Rosalind Kind, <gasps> Barbara's sister, and who who looks like her, who sings like, but she's her own person. Oh, she's, and no, she's, she's lovely. phenomenal. She's lovely. She's lovely. I love she's lovely. Rosie Kind. She is wonderful. She's Brooklyn adult. girl, love her. She's going to be in the house. Steve Rollins, our great friend, who's an incredible musician and composer, is going to be playing with her. And Harry Schock will be opening the show. She wrote Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady. And um, Fred Melman is going to be reading for us. And it's going to be fantastic. And that's at the end of June. So June 25th. Anyway, been fabulous. Pete, thank you so much. Yay. Look for Pete George out there. And uh, we'll see you next week on uh, Game Changers. <laughs>